um, is the infant baptism. Uh, uh, some people have of the opinion that why should you baptize, uh, baptize someone who doesn't even know what you are doing to him or her? Um, I am the Bishop Theologian of the Church of Nigeria and the only Bishop Theologian ever in the Anglican Communion so far. So I should be the one to give explanation to these things from the theological perspective. I want to encourage our people not to allow arguments and controversies to distract us from our primary motion and motive and assignment of the mission. Christianity lost ground because we found controversies in one way or the other that have made us not to be focused on our primary assignment. And in the midst of controversies, the church is the worst for it. This is yet another controversy. There are hundreds of other arguments that people want to raise. The first thing is to say, we are Anglican church. We came from the Roman Catholic church. We inherited this tradition. If we inherited it, it has become part of our life. We need to live with it if we do not believe in it. But let's do some theologizing. Number one, who is a human being? And where does life begin? What grace of people do you have that constitute the church of God? We, it's a complex theology. I can tell you that the church of God has a wide scope. We talk of the saints militant and the saints triumphant. Even those who have died in the faith, who are saints, they are part of the church. That's the reason why the burial grounds are very close to many of the churches here and there. There's a theology behind it. That's the reason why in African society, people bury their dead in the home because they think the ancestors are still part of their life. We have a sociology, we have a philosophy, we have a theology. So that's one. It's part of our theology that everybody in the community, irrespective of your age, you are part of that community. Where does life begin from? And who are members of the community? Another controversy. What of those who are in the womb? Is that baby in the womb a human being recognized by God or a mere biological photos? I need to be comprehensive in my answer. Two stories. One, God said to Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. When you were still in the womb of your mother, I had already ordained you. Ordination ceremony is ordained. So if God had already ordained the prophet from the womb, <laughs> then as far as God is concerned, the call and ordination are taking place. So the baby in the womb is part of the community. Second story. When Jesus Christ's mother came to salute Zachariah and Elizabeth, the baby, John the Baptist, in the womb of Mary, of, uh, of Elizabeth, did what? Left for joy. How did the baby hear the voice and recognize this? The voice of the Messiah I've come to work for. In other words, the church has this position. The baby in the womb is a part of the church. Once a child is born, it's part of the economy. Move on in the argument. In that case, children, are they liable? They are liable like adults. And that's the reason why the circumcision of the father must be extended to the children. Children can be cursed or blessed up to the fourth generation. So if a child is a part of the community, if a child has been brought into the world with destiny, with covenant attached to that child, you must be able to take steps that will protect that child. Losses, everybody who is to be in the community of Christ must be baptized. Now the church faces a situation where what do you do with the children? Are they part of the community? Yes or no? They are. So if baptism is for everybody, why do you want to leave them out? Well, you could say you want to wait until when they become adults. But, but in every case, do you wait when they became adults, when you took decisions for them as parents? They were not the ones who decided they were going to go to school. They were not the ones who took many of the decisions that were taken. The parents took them for them. If you took decisions, political, social, personal, you can also take decisions spiritual for them. Every child under the law, before you become an adult, 
you can be excused if you break some laws because you think you are still a child. That means the law patronizes them as patron. Now, the church says the parents are liable for their children. The Bible says, teach your child the way to go. When they grow, they will not depart from it. The responsibility to take care of them is that of the, of the parents. Therefore, parents can take decisions for their children and they can stand by them to watch them. And when they now grow up, the children can come when they become adults at confirmation to renew the vows that were made on their behalf by their parents or their godmothers or godfathers. That's what the church has said. And the reason why they did it is simply this. If children are part of the body of Christ, is it not possible that some children will die before they become adults? What happens to them if baptism is a necessary right and there are children who are in the community, we know that infant mortality was very common and many young people who are children, they died. So if they died without going through the baptism, what is their position in the economy of salvation? When Jesus was talking about salvation, he said, if you believe and you are baptized, you will be saved. He said, if you believe, you will see the kingdom of God. And if you are baptized by water, you will enter into the kingdom. So if baptism is a prerequisite, logically speaking, if children are also part of it, then something must be done by the church to protect them by giving them a right. It's a different argument whether baptism is by immersion or by sprinkling or by aspersion. That's a different one. But infant baptism is to say we recognize children. And by the way, can I just say this? These people you call children, are they really children? I can tell you that what the children of today know, their grandfather didn't know some years ago. If you look at a boy of eight, you say this boy is a child. But a boy of eight called Josiah ruled the whole country of Judah. So what are you talking about? How old was Samuel when he was prophesying and telling Eli what God said, when God was speaking to him? So our theology must be very balanced. And the church will not get distracted. We are people of reality. People do die. And they die as infants. Well, you can read some books that tell you what happens to infants when they die and what, what happens to them in heaven. Do they grow in heaven? Do they stay there in heaven? But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Of theirs is the children of the kingdom of God. So infant baptism is a preemptive measure taken to protect the interests of the children at baptism. Another argument can go on to say, if you are in doubt, if the infant becomes adult, nothing stops the infant from seeking baptism by immersion. Although you can argue, can you be baptized twice? That argument can still go on. Can you repent today and go back to sin and ask for repentance again? And so, so the argument is very endless. As far as I'm concerned, we recognize adult baptism. An Anglican church recognizes baptism by immersion. When I was a professor in the UK, and I was attached to the Diocese of, Bar of Birmingham, uh, the, the bishop of Bobby Birmingham was baptizing people by immersion inside the church. He brought something that looks like a bathtub here and was baptizing people by immersion. So, uh, Anglican Church recognizes baptism by immersion and recognizes baptism, baptism of adults. We are not against it. But what the church is saying here is for that segment of our population that was done to protect them as members of the Christ, to enjoy the grace that attends to baptism. And later when they go up, the same vows that were made on their behalf, they repeat it at other stage. I don't think we are losing anything, but just arguing because some Pentecostals say their theology does not accommodate it. And these Pentecostals came from us anyway. And uh, in many cases, many of the arguments really have no valid basis, except sentiments. And you find them changing themselves. They started condemning our hymns, saying they are dead hymns, they are not lively here. Are they not coming back to the hymns? They were condemning our music as not being charismatic. Now, can anything replace church organ and church music? In those days, they were condemning us dressing as a, as a, as a clerics, wearing color here and there. What do you find them doing now? They, 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 they are now wearing them and wearing my tie, wearing coat, doing consecration. They are doing virtually everything Anglican. So if people who are criticizing you are copying you, I think you are on the right track.